the usual. <coughs> Any questions that you have for me before we start lecture? So one week till the exam, I believe. All right. Okay, so I'm going to continue with my last lecture. I was talking about phylogeny estimation. And before I get to phylogeny estimation, or before I continue, I want to take a quick detour on naming things, all right? So um, what do I mean by naming things? Well, this is, it's, an, it's a necessary part of being a biologist sometimes, which is you need to be able to name groups of organisms. Okay? And you're probably, you're probably familiar with uh, the Linnaean hierarchy. This is the, the naming system, that, um, or the classification system that Linnaeus uh, came up with, the Swedish scientist I was telling you about, where every organism has a genus and species name. I talked about that when I spoke about species. But every, every species also finds itself in a particular family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, where as you go up this hierarchy, the groups become more and more inclusive. That is to say, they include more and more organisms. Okay. Um, so I just want you to be aware that there is a system. You probably heard about it from high school. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to remember. The way I remember it was um, with uh, this, you know, the sentence, King Philip came over from German shores. I think other people have other uh, mechanisms of remembering that. Okay. But anyways, this is the, the traditional way of naming organisms. And you often find a biologist such as Darwin who studied barnacles. In the course of studying a group of organisms, um, they're called monographs, they'd also you know, publish or propose a classification system for the group. In, in general, the, speak, the, you know, the, the hierarchy matches the order of the relationships for the most part. Okay. More, you know, there's a lot of biologists today that believe that the Linnaean hierarchy should be done away with. It's not the majority of biologists, but there's a large number of them that believe that there should be a different system of classifying organisms. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but they, they, uh, argue that, they argue that you should only be naming monophyletic groups. That is to say, a monophyletic group is a group that includes the ancestor plus all of the descendants of that ancestry. Okay. So as an example, I made a little tree here of vertebrates, as I remember. I think there might be some disagreement about the place in the turtles on this tree, but it should suffice. And one group you can imagine is tetrapoda. These are vertebrates that have four limbs, or tetrapods. Okay. So you can actually circle tetrapods on this tree. And it includes all those species, all those groups. Okay. Tetrapoda, as I've drawn it on this tree, is a monophyletic group. Okay. So it's monophyletic. It includes the ancestor and all of the descendants of that ancestor. Now, uh, let's give you an example of a paraphyletic group. You know, reptiles, water reptiles, if I were to, you know, are amphibians reptiles? No. Mammals are not reptiles. Are turtles reptiles? Yes. Lizards and snakes? Clearly. Crocodiles reptiles? Yes. Birds? Yeah. Right? So traditionally, the, tradi the traditional meaning of reptilia does not include birds. And so the traditional meaning of a reptilia would include, oops, oops, keep doing this. Includes that group that I just circled with the more natural excursion. So this little inner circle I drew that excludes birds is called a paraphyletic group. Okay, that's for an example of reptilian. It includes the ancestor and some, but not all of the descendants. Some, but not all. It includes the ancestor and includes the descendants except for birds, right? Now there are some, you know, there, this is where it becomes tricky. If you know the person pretty well that you're speaking to, is a, say he's a, an expert in dinosaurs or some other group of, of vertebrates, it's just possible that if you say the word reptilia, he understands it to mean, or she understands it to mean birds as well. So there are some biologists who have redefined reptilia to be monophyletic. And so when they say reptiles or reptilia, they also mean birds. Okay, just be aware of this. It's tricky because you have to know the person you're speaking to. There's one of these people who really believes that all groupings should be monophyletic, and if you know that, then you guys understand what you mean when you say reptilia. So it can be co complicated. And the, and the final group is a polyphyletic group, which does not even include the ancestor. It's always difficult to come up with examples of polyphyletic groups because they usually don't have a formal Latin name associated with them. But as an example, um, you could take flying uh, vertebrates, right? flying vertebrates that would include birds and bats, right? and also pterosaurs, which come off here. Um, so that would be a group that, if you were to draw it, would kind of take birds in and then come over here and take a few of the mammals in. Right? That would be a polyphyletic group. It doesn't even include the ancestor. Now it's getting messy, but a polyphyletic group might include all kinds of shades and something like that. No, it does not include the ancestor. But they're also difficult to point to because there's so few polyphyletic groups that anybody treats seriously, really. Okay, so that was my excursion to naming things. Now let's continue on with our regularly programmed material. So this is where I left off. I was talking about uh, phylogeny having been uh, given us a lot of insights into the origin of uh, birds and also into the phylogeny of mammals. I just want to point out another thing here, some more terms, um, which I'm sure you'd be very happy to hear about. But I, I pointed out that these characteristics, these unique characteristics of all the long twenty branches. So all the species above the point of the tree share the characteristic of having at least simple feathers. Right? Um, at this point, you have complex feathers evolved. At this point, you have a breastbone with a prominent uh, ridge called the keel evolved. Right? So these are characteristics of species above that point of the tree share. And these characteristics that are shared, you know, driving a certain part of the tree and shared by other species in that group above that point of the tree are called synapomorphies. I believe I have that in the next. So there's, there is some uh, terminology that's associated with trees. I try to keep it to a minimum because um, well, we could spend a lot of time with different terms and stuff. So I'm just going to talk about two of them in lecture. Snake is a shared derived characteristic. The characteristic such as hair that is a, is a good characteristic that unites all mammals. Right? Hair is not a good example of a, a characteristic that unites primates because it evolved much more primitively than uh, in primates. Primates are a group of, of mammals. Right? But hair is a good snake for mammals, as are, is a special jaw joint that all mammals share called the dentary one muscle dot jaw joint. That'd be another snake for mammals. Okay? And homoplasia is a term that biologists often use when they're talking about characters that evolve more than once on a tree. When you have to actually explain the characteristics of evolution with two or more changes as a homoplastic character. All right, so I'm going to skip that. So I want to um, <coughs> talk about another pretty cool use of phylogenies. And um, it's, it's involved, it, phylogenies played a role in nailing down what's called the endosymbiotic hypothesis for the origin of organelles. So you all know that eukaryotic cells are big and they're complex. Right? And one of the characteristics that eukaryotic cells have that prokaryotic cells don't have is they have organelles. They have basically compartmentalization within the cell where different subunits do different things. Okay? Um, and the, the, this hypothesis is, well, how in the heck did you get eukaryotic cells evolved in the first place? Well, the idea is that the organelles are the, are the remnants of an ancient symbiotic relationship between different prokaryotes. That is to say, when you look at a mitochondria under a microscope, what you're seeing is basically its ancestor was a free living bacterium sometime in the very, very distant past. It's a pretty interesting hypothesis. But what type of evidence would support that hypothesis? Because it's a pretty radical idea. Oh, so here's, here's just a picture of the cell that you can get from any biology textbook. But the point here is that you have structure inside the eukaryotic cell where you have compartments. These compartments are, are called organelles. And like I said, the, this hypothesis uh, tries to explain how these, you know, what is the origin of organelles. So what is the evidence for the idea that these organelles are anciently free living bacteria? Well, there's all sorts of interesting clues that would give you this. So first of all, they're very superficially, the mitochondria, for instance, in chloroplasts, which you find in plants, are superficially a lot like bacteria, about the right size, for instance. Okay? Um, they have a circular, you, know, you do have circular DNA in your mitochondria. Well, and there's circular DNA in chloroplasts. You know, this, this circular bit of DNA is very much like the genome of a bacterium,
Antibiotics such as streptomycin block protein synthesis in mitochondria just as they do in bacteria, which is pretty cool. Um, similarly, inhibitors of protein synthesis in eukaryotes don't block synthesis in mitochondria. So that's, that's making the mitochondria sound a lot like a bacterium. And, um, and other, you know, there's other things as well. But the original evidence was basically superficial. They look like bacteria in terms of their size, and they have a circular bit of DNA that has many of the characteristics of, of um, bacteria. So what was, so this is remarkable, somebody hadn't done this earlier, but I mentioned that the mitochondria, for instance, have their own DNA, and that they even have some proteins, some genes on the DNA that um, are involved in protein synthesis, okay, such as ribosomal RNA. And what, what people did here is they sequenced the, the mitochondria, specifically that particular ribosomal RNA gene, and you can find that ribosomal gene in everything. Every cell has this. Every organism has ribosomal DNA. It's, it's one of the universal, most basic machinery in all the cells. So this is a particular gene that you can compare across all of life. The last lecture I showed you that you are here phylogeny of all of life. The type of genes that they use to construct that phylogeny are things like ribosomal gene, uh, DNA. Right? So they say, okay, well, these mitochondria have ribosomal DNA. Let's compare that, you know, throw them into a phylogenetic analysis and see where they come out. Do the mitochondria come out with eukaryotes, or do they come out with a nuclear portion of eukaryotes, nuclear genome portion of eukaryotes, or do they come out with bacteria? Where do they come out? They come out with bacteria, right? Which is, you know, to me at least nails the, you know, nails the case. Um, and although there's not a lot of species, lot of, there are not a lot of DNA sequences of different bacterial species on the tree I'm showing you here, when you ask which bacteria are the mitochondria and chloroplasts most closely related to, they're actually most closely related to bacteria that have a particular lifestyle, which is to live inside of other cells, things like Rickettsia wolbachia. These are bacteria that actually live inside of other cells. Okay, so they actually have their closest relatives already have that, that lifestyle, which is pretty amazing. So that's just an example of how phylogenies have been used to really nail down a, a fairly old hypothesis about the origin of eukaryotic cells. Here's another kind of interesting use of phylogenies, besides just saying, okay, how are things related? Uh, this is a little gopher, right? Not a very good picture of a gopher. And that is a very, very large magnification of a louse that lives on this gopher, all right? So gophers and lots of vertebrates, including humans occasionally, have lice, right? And often the lice are specific to a species. As I say, on some species of gophers, you will only find certain species of lice living on them, okay? So this is work that was done, geez, about 25, 20, 25 years ago now. What these people did is they took a group of gophers, and they sequenced the mitochondrial DNA from the gophers, and they made a phylogeny of the gophers. So over here on the left side, we have a species phylogeny of the gophers. And then what they did is for each one of these gophers, when they collected them in the field, they picked off the lice they found, identify which species of lice were found on that gopher, and then they sequenced the mitochondrial DNA from the, from the lice, right? And they made a phylogeny of the lice. On the right side, you see the phylogeny of the lice. Okay, that's over here. And these bars represent, you know, this, this louse species lives on this gopher. This louse species lives on this gopher, and so forth. Now, does anybody see anything interesting about the phylogenies of the gophers and the lice? By eye. This isn't perfect, but do you see anything interesting by eye here? They look like, yeah, people are kind of doing this. They look like they correspond, right? There, there's, it's not perfect, but the correspondence is kind of interesting. Especially look at the five species on the top of the tree. Look at how the branching relationships of the, of the gophers and lice match up perfectly on the top, for the top five species. And although they don't match perfectly on the bottom, you do get lots of you know, bits of the tree that per perfectly match. Like here's two species of gophers that are each other's closest relatives, and they both have lice, which are also each other's closest relatives, right? So what this looks like is, you know, the hypothesis is, you know, what, would, what would cause this sort of matching between the louse phylogeny and the gopher phylogeny? Well, the idea is that whenever you had a speciation event in the gophers, it triggered a speciation event in the lice. Right? Through allopatric speciation. The, the gophers, for whatever reasons, were geographically separated through allopatric speciation, which means the lice were kind of going, on for, you know, going along for the ride were also se separated. Okay? So that type of pattern, um, this type of pattern corresponds between the phylogenies of the hosts and the parasites in this case, is evidence of co-speciation. It's very difficult to explain this pattern any other way. And people have done a similar type of studies in ants, and this is an example of um, an ant which cultivates a fungus in its, in, in its gardens. They basically cut leaves, they bring the leaves down to their little dens, and, um, and they uh, cultivate these fungus which they actually then eat. The little farmers. And people have done this with the phylogeny of the ants and the different species of ants that have this life cycle. That's on the right side of the, of the, of the figure here. And on the left, they have the phylogeny of the fungal species. Once again, note that there's a close correspondence between the phylogeny of the, of the ants and the fungi that they cultivate. Once again, the idea of the explanation is co-speciation. Speciation events in the, in the ants cause the, cause the fungus that they cultivate to also speciate through allopatric speciation. And here's another very, uh, very uh, use, useful use of phylogenies. Um, don't like use, use the word useful use, but here's a good use of phylogenies in what's the field called epidemiology. Epidemi epidemiologists are people who study the origin and spread of infectious diseases. Okay? And so phylogenies have been uh, uh, you know, in the toolbox of epidemiologists now for decades. Here's an example of an of a epidemic that you guys have probably heard of before, the HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. Um, and it was first really noticed in the early 1980s. The, the origin of the infection in humans must have predated it by probably 30, 40, 50 years maybe, but it became really noticeable in the early 80s, especially here in San Francisco at first. Um, now, in humans, this, this particular virus is called the human immunodeficiency virus, but in our closest relatives in primates, such as the chimp and, and other primate species, it's called the simian immunodeficiency virus, it's SIV. Okay? But it's a, it's a very similar virus. You can, you can sequence genes from SIV and HIV and very easily line them up and compare them and make phylogenies out of them, which is one of the very first things people did when they started sequencing HIV and then SIV. The things you see here, there's two main groups of HIV in humans. You have this HIV2 group, and on the top you see there's another group of, um, of HIV sequences, the HIV1 sequences. So there's at least two main groups of HIV that infected humans. And then let's just concentrate on the top portion of that tree. Notice that you have HIV and SIV intermingled. Right? You'll see that you have HIV human, I think is what they put next to it, and SIV chimpanzee. So the closest relatives of the human HIV are the chimpanzee SIV sequences. Not only that, you can infer from this tree that there were more than one introductions of HIV-1 into the human population. It happened more than once. It wasn't just one chance event where SIV went into humans where we call HIV, but it happened more than once. Some people hypothesize as many as like a half dozen times. Okay? Phylogenies are the evidence for these types of statements. And really, the statement's only as good as the, the phylogenies are based on, but, but it looks pretty convincing to many people that there are multiple uh, invasions of HIV or SIV into humans. Okay? And by the way, it was probably the bushmeat trade that did it. I don't know what you're thinking right now, but it's probably bushmeat um, uh, trade where they, people are butchering uh, chimpanzees in the wild, giving them meat, and if they have an open wound on their hand, they can become infected by the virus. And here's an example um, where HIV, I mean, phylogenies have actually been used in a court of law. Um, this is basically what, what happened is, this is in Florida, there was a, a sort of local outbreak of HIV among people that didn't have the risk factors normally associated with HIV infection. And the question is, like, the, the, you know, the doctors were noticing these patients in all a certain area and asking, well, what's causing these people to get, you know, how do they get the, how do they get the viral infection? And it turns out they all had the same dentist, right? Yeah. <laughs> so
It means local control. These are people that lived in the area of Florida where this occurred, but had never visited, had HIV, but had never visited the dentist, right? So the idea being that they got their infection somewhere else, right? Notice this. I, mean, I think I, did I do this? Yes, I did. Notice that you have this clustering of the patients with the, with, with the dentist. This would be taken as evidence that he did, you know, that it'd be very likely to get this pattern unless the dentist did actually somehow infect the patients with his own HIV. How would that happen? He actually died before they could prosecute him. Um, and then you'll notice too that there's a couple patients that don't fit this pattern, right? Now after the fact, they, 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 I was told that these patients did have other risk factors that they initially didn't tell uh, people about. But, um, but the point is, at least some of these patients were infected by HIV. And it, and it turns out the phylogenies are now admissible as evidence in, the, in court. Um, my PhD advisor actually worked on a, was called as a witness in a Louisiana court case where, um, once again, it was a dentist. I don't know what it is about dentists. But um, I, know, I know some dentists are very nice people, but whatever. Like, these guys are these, these particular dentists are given the entire field of bad rap, I suppose. Um, but, anyways, he, um, his, his girlfriend, uh, they're having troubles, evidently, and he injected her in the middle of the night with something, she said. She wasn't certain what it was. It turns out he, he didn't have HIV, but he had patients that did. So he had these samples, and evidently he infected her with HIV and just being an extra jerk. He also uh, infected her with um, hepatitis. <laughs> but, anyways, the, the, the phylogenies played a, played a big role in this particular case, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I said, <laughs> is it, uh, you really should. Yeah. Yes. In any case, so this is a, so phylogeny can be useful for that, for that case. And then I just want to show you one more example of, of, of a phylogeny of HIV. Um, and just to give you an idea about how rapidly HIV evolves, these are all sequences isolated from a single patient over the course of his infection. This, this is a male. He um, started in this program to study about three months post-infection. And every couple of months, he'd go into the doctor's office, they'd draw some blood, and they isolate a half, you know, dozen or so of HIV and sequence them. So what you see is, well, it's very difficult to see. It's impossible, frankly, to see the labels. But these labels on the tips are the times at which, like, the month number and the sequence number for the, for the, um, for the sample that was taken. So in general, on the left side of this phylogeny, you have the HIV samples were taken early in the infection, and um, the rightmost sequences on this phylogeny are the ones that were sampled very late in the infection, you know, just before this person um, died, uh, passed away. Um, but the point here is that, you know, if I were to show you a phylogeny like this, you might think this could be mammals in terms of how much, how much diversity you see in the sequences. HIV is such a rapidly evolving virus that when, you know, that a single infection can generate, you know, a single ancestral HIV infection in a person can eventually generate this much diversity, okay? And these, these types of phylogenies with, with, of infections within patients have been used for all sorts of purposes uh, to study the evolution of the virus in a, in a single person, okay? And in particular, there's this interesting um, change in what's called the co-receptor usage in, in HIV. So normally, HIV, when it gets into a cell, it needs a receptor, and then it has another protein on the surface of the cell called the co-receptor that it needs to bind to. Okay? Early, in the, early in these infections, there's almost always one co-receptor used. And late in the infection, actually, it's kind of the bad news when it occurs. Uh, the co-receptor changes, uh, the HIV changes its co-receptor usage. Right? And they actually have names for the viruses, R5 versus X4, for which, which co-receptor it's using. That's not really important here. But the point here is, these biologists can be used to um, study the, the, the dynamics of an infection in a single individual. Even. All right, that is, well, that was a lot. Um, I'll just run out of time. I want to change gears a bit. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the rock record, which sounds kind of like a weird thing to be talking about in a biology course, and as much as I can, fossils, okay? And I just want to point out that um, over the course of the last 100, 200 years, really, geologists have been able to make a detailed accounting of Earth's history, right? It's getting better and better through time, but we, you know, when a geologist goes out in the field, he or she can identify the age of the rocks you know, that you're standing on, which is, when you think about it, a pretty major accomplishment. And when they're walking around, they can say, that rock is older or younger than this other rock, for the most part. Okay? So over the last 200 years, a time scale has been assembled by geologists for Earth's history. I'm showing you here the last 540 million years of this history. Okay? Note two things. You have these uh, periods, which um, you, are from, you will need to know, the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, and Pennsylvania, and Permian. These are the periods of the Paleozoic. Then you have the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. These are different periods of the Mesozoic. And then you have the Tertiary and the Quaternary, which are different periods of the Cenozoic. You know, for instance, the age of dinosaurs was during the Mesozoic. The earliest, heart, the earliest organisms we have that um, have hard parts, that is to say shells, occur at the base of the Cambrian. The, 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 the time scale becomes much more detailed once we have fossils that kind of sprinkle through the rocks. The, the fossils themselves help us determine the, the ages of the rocks, or at least the relative ages of the rocks. You also see that I have numbers. These are in terms of millions of years ago, so, and they represent the, the age uh, of the boundaries between these, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. So the Cambrian started about 540 million years ago. The end of the Permian, the beginning of the Triassic was about 250 million years ago. And the end of the Cretaceous, the beginning of the Tertiary was 65. Right. So this is stuff that you should, you should know. And I do have a, a way of memorizing this, just like I had for the Linnaean hierarchy, which I guess I'll give you. Um, so Cambrian says, can Oliver see down my pants pockets? Tom Jones can, Tom's queer. So meaning strange. Um, but there's, there's two, different, two different methods of dating that have been used to assemble these, these relative dates. One is called relative, relative age dating, and the other is absolute. Relative age dating is the one that was used the earliest, okay? and then later in the 1950s when people uh, started to be able to measure different radioactive isotopes in rocks, were they able to actually put actual millions of years on the rocks. Okay, so let's go talk about how they, how they do absolute and, and relative age dating. So there's some very simple principles that geologists have used to order rocks in the rock record. Okay? Um, so here are some very simple principles to follow. And note that I'm showing you a picture of exposed, uh, exposed beds of rock here along a cliff. But the, the, the common pattern is you can actually see rocks of different types, different colors, different uh, particle sizes of the, of the sediment and so forth. And, they, and there's these bands. These are called, uh, often called formations, is the, the word that the geologists use to identify a group of rocks or some rocks that, that have specific characteristics. And the first thing is that these rocks are layered. And one of the very first principles that people use is this idea of superposition. The older rocks are on the bottom, the younger rocks are on the top. For sedimentary rocks, as I say, rocks that form in, from the from